that's looking at me. Yes, I think that's During springtime, the Salmon Coast Research Station in the Broughton Archipelago becomes a hive of activity. Everything is centered around the salmon. Most of the projects are aimed at trying to understand the interactions between the fish farms, the ecosystem, and the wild fish. As they begin feeding, I'll disturb them using a model heron to simulate a predator attack. Every researcher is intently focused on their project, on their particular piece of the puzzle. The science and learning that takes place here has a special aspect. Rather than studying an isolated biological interaction in a lab, here the researchers are placed in the heart of the entire functioning marine ecosystem itself. Here, their lab is the ocean. Out of the crew of researchers at the station, Martin Grukozik has been coming here the longest. This will be his fifth year studying the interactions between open net cage salmon farming, lice, and the wild fish. His method involves taking the information that is gathered in the field and fitting it into mathematical models in an attempt to estimate the total impact of the farms. The goal of the station, I guess, is to provide um, a point of access to studying the ecology in the Broughton Archipelago a point of access for young uh, graduate students who you know, can be characterized as being really hardworking, dedicated, and very poor. They don't bring the money in like, say, DFO, so um, it's uh, an important facility for independent academic research. It's a great spot for studying the impacts of aquaculture on salmon because there's a high density of fish farms around here. It's a wonderful place to study juvenile salmon because you can track migration routes, you can see where they're going. And it is uh, a very rich area. There's all kinds of different species of fish. The herring are super abundant. We have humpback whales that come through here. There's thousands of dolphins around. It's, uh, it's a really exciting place as a biologist to be. Mornings at the research station usually begin with a crew heading off to catch fish for their trials. Oh, they're still jumping. It seems that everyone is after the wild salmon fry. It is a difficult run for the pink and chum salmon fry. Even under natural conditions, 80 to 90 percent will fall prey to one predator or another. The balance is a fine one, and this is a system that seems to have been thrown off kilter. This year, the numbers of pink and chum salmon fry are a fraction of what they should be. A critical situation when the existence of so many other species depends upon the return of these salmon. One of the problems may be that the lice from the fish farms are attaching themselves to the tiny salmon fry, making it difficult for them to escape from hungry predators. One of these predators are the larger coho salmon smolts, which feed voraciously on the smaller pink and chum fry. This crew of researchers is running experiments to understand how the lice are affecting the fry's ability to escape from predators. We're going to be running a few predation trials with coho smolts and pink fry. We have a large net pan rigged up here and we divide that in half and on one side we have our 50 coho predators and on the other side we have 200 pink fry. And some of these fry are infected with sea lice and others aren't. What we're curious about finding out is, does being infected with sea lice increase your susceptibility to predation? We start the experiment by dropping the divider line in between them and just monitoring their behavior. So we score all sorts of data on the coho striking, their success in striking, or their failures, or the flashing behavior in the fry. Generally what we see is um, the school of fry will be higher up on the surface and the coho will be deeper down below, kind of pushing the fry to the surface. And so you'll see this um, pack of coho swimming beneath them and just kind of taking their time, biding their time, going around and then occasionally actually strike right in into the middle of the school. It's almost like watching a, a pack of wolves uh, surrounding a herd of caribou. 
Often though, the heavily infested fish have this certain behavior where they flash. So as they're swimming along in a big school, in an organized school, they will all of a sudden just kind of dart out to the side and, and their silvered sides will kind of flash in the light. Almost analogous to like a flasher on a salmon rod. It's kind of a positive attraction to these larger salmonid predators. This is something we've been looking at for a few years now and it seems to be fairly obvious that the lice really hinder the fry's ability to avoid predation. So you can think of yourself if you had a large, large parasite on you, obviously that's going to affect your behavior, affect your speed, your agility, it's going to affect a lot of things. Predation is natural. What is complicating the natural cycles is the high lice infestations. In pristine ecosystems, lice levels are low in the springtime when the juveniles are migrating to sea. This year in the Broughton, where there is a high concentration of fish farms, 90% of the wild salmon fry were infected with heavy lice loads. It may take years to understand how this will affect the web of interactions in this vastly complicated and dynamic ecosystem.